All right, it is 4.30 p.m. Um, Freeholder Hertzberg and Freeholder Director Sylvia Patilla will not be participating in this evening's meeting, um, so I would like to begin. Due to public health issues arising from the coronavirus situation, the Sussex County Board of Chosen Freeholders will conduct this meeting remotely via conference call. Callers are invited to listen and will have an opportunity to make comments by calling 973-310-7191. As a side note, the Sussex County Technical School PowerPoint presentation can be found on our website at www.sussex.nj.us. You can please visit the freeholder page for our agenda to view this presentation. So I'd like to call the meeting to order. Roll call vote, please. Freeholder Fantasia. Here. Freeholder Fasano. Here. Freeholder Hertzberg will be absent. Freeholder Director Patola will be absent. Freeholder Yardley. Here. I'd like to invite you to join me in a moment of silence and salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America, of America. and to the, to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, nation under, God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice and for, all. for all. Pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, PL 1975, adequate notice is defined by Section 3D of Chapter 231. PL 1975 has been made by regular mail, such notice being submitted on June 30th, 2020 from the Administrative Center of the County of Sussex located at 1 Spring Street, Newton, New Jersey to the following, New Jersey Herald, New Jersey Sunday Herald, Star Ledger, WSUS Radio, WNNJ Radio, and is also posted on the bulletin board maintained in the Administrative Center for Public Announcements and has been submitted to the Sussex County Clerk in compliance with said act. So I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make the motion, Herb. Second, Second. Anthony. All in favor? Aye. Uh. Aye. Okay, our first item, we have a proclamation uh, this evening recognizing Hopakong resident Eagle Scout Matthew Smith. So I'm going to turn this over to Freeholder Fasano, being a Hopakong resident and being that he had the pleasure of actually participating in the ceremony. Thank you, Freeholder Fantasia. And uh, before I read the proclamation, I did have the chance to attend Matthew's Eagle, uh, Eagle Scout Ceremony, Court of Honor Ceremony last week uh, at Hopakon, an outdoors event, a socially distanced event, of course, but nonetheless, uh, cool events to be part of. Matthew, uh, I had the opportunity to know uh, through my school board days uh, when he was a student and I was a school board member. Uh, and I'm not surprised at all to see him uh, reach this tremendous accomplishment. So without further ado, uh, the proclamation reads, whereas Matthew Smith, a member of Boy Scouts of America Troop 88, Hopakon, New Jersey, has earned scouting's highest rank. And whereas Matthew is a 2020 graduate from Hopakon High School and was a member of the marching band. He will be attending Roanoke College in Virginia as a political science major this fall. And whereas Matthew's Eagle Leadership Project involved updating a local camping area in Hopakon on Bear Pond, he cut and removed large trees that had come down in a storm and had gravel added to the parking lot. Thanks to Matthew's hard work, the local community is able to enjoy camping and boating at Camp Casperson in, in a more safe and relaxing way. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Sussex County Board of Chosen Freeholders trust the SCOTE oath and, oath and law will continue to reinforce Matthew's ideals and contribute to his exemplary code of conduct as an adult. Be it further resolved that the Board of Chosen Freeholders of the County of Sussex wish, wishes Matthew Smith continued good success and scouting in life. By the order of the Board of Chosen Freeholders, Sylvia Patillo, Freeholder Director, John Fantasia, Deputy Freeholder Director, Anthony Fasano, Freeholder, Joshua Hertzberg, Freeholder, and Herbert Yardley, Freeholder. Thank you. 
Thank you, and congratulations uh, again, Matthew. Um, you are quite a, an accomplished young man at your age. You have such a bright future ahead of you. Uh, you have a beautiful family. You come from a family of public servants. Uh, both your parents are very involved, either be it on the school board or on their, you know, local councils. And we see them out and contributing to the community. And the apple did not fall far from the tree. We see you absolutely making great contributions to your community, and we're really proud of you. And thank you for your work. So um, next on our agenda, we have our presentation. We have the superintendent of Sussex County Technical Schools, Gus Modla, who is going to share with us a PowerPoint presentation, the Career and Technical Education Program Expansion Grant, Securing Our Children's Future Bond Act. Thank you for the inter introduction. Um, first, I'd like to thank Freeholder Fasano for attending our graduation ceremony in July, he, he took the time out of his day to uh, do the keynote uh, speech at both our ceremonies, um, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, so we could uh, properly socially distance students and parents for that ceremony. And it was a great um, opportunity for him to speak to our students, and um, we really thank him for that opportunity to come to the school. So uh, thank you, Freeholder Fasano. Um, this, this evening... This evening, I'm presenting uh, to the Freeholder Board um, Sussex Tech's um, proposed plan for a grant opportunity called Securing Our Children's Future Bond Act. Uh, this process started uh, a few years ago at the Department of um, – at the – in Trenton with the um, legislature to look at ways to expand opportunities for students to um, have a vocational education in areas that are in high demand and are skilled labor driven uh, demanded occupations. So um, the Bond Act participants on the first slide, we really want to be collaborative and uh, reach out to people and stakeholders in the community. So we need to include business partners in this process and business owners where our students will eventually go and work upon graduation from our school and also um, post-secondary programs. Um, we included our Sussex County Vocational Technical Education Association members who uh, served on a committee. We talked to our career technical education teachers for the specific programs we want to look to expand and improve um, the administration at the school. Uh, we always want to collaborate with the uh, Board of Chosen Freeholders in the county. Um, you always have been supportive of our school, and we want to continue that uh, close relationship. And our architect, uh, Chris Wolverton from HQW, um, who's helped us draft this plan and the, some of the drawings that have been included. And then finally, uh, the New Jersey Council of Vocational Technical Schools, it's 21 uh, county uh, superintendents get together um, monthly to hold meetings, and uh, we're all on the same page in terms of uh, how, how we want to expand opportunities for students. So I'm going to go through some of the grant objectives first. Um, the first objective is really to increase the capacity for CT programs that offer high demand technical skilled careers aligned to the county labor market. So we want to make sure we're looking at needs of our county of Sussex and how these programs align with those needs. Also, um, all proposed projects will be on district-owned property here at Sussex Tech. I know some of the other counties are looking to um, build programs that are either held in other campuses around their counties, but at Sussex we're going to focus on any programs that will be here on campus. Um, also, when we look at this grant, it's a competitive grant, we are going to be putting in this grant and really the money will be allocated based on a rubric and we're really going up against the other county vocational schools. Uh, they're going to award four grants of up to $40 million in the state and six smaller grants up to $25 million. We're not We're, we're going to put in for a smaller grant. It's not going to be $25 million, and I'll go into detail later at the end about what the cost uh, projections possibly would be um, once we finalize the, the plan and the draft for the grant application. So um, in that rubric to how they score it, they're looking at accessibility and access. So um, our programs have to be accessible to students in the county to come here from the sending districts. And we have to look at that demographic data when we, we start talking about um, non-traditional students and different um, other categories. Uh, we need to have collaboration. So we definitely want to collaborate with our business partners in the county 
um, Sussex County Community College, other higher ed institutions in the area that we have partnerships with, uh, local business owners, and the trade unions. That's really important for us to make sure that our students have that next step planned out when they graduate and where, where do they go next? Is it college locally here at the, at the county? It, are they going right to work? Are they going into the trade unions? So these programs would align with their needs also. Uh, the rubric will also score, score us on how we are going to embed industry valued credentials into these programs. So that our students, for example, in welding, they graduate and they have an opportunity to get certified in the American um, AWS, American Weld Society uh, certification process. So we need to continue with those credential pieces and will be scored there. Um, I mentioned the uh, county college credits. Um, they want to see us continue with the with the opportunity for students to take dual credit opportunities while in high school and their CTE programs that are aligned with the curriculum of that local colleges and the community college. So when a student graduate, they have college credit on their transcripts that they could use right away and possibly graduate college earlier, which some of our students have done in the past um, because they're, they're picking up those college credits here at school. Um, they want to see apprenticeships, the opportunities for students to um, go out and work while they're in high school with industry partners to get that hands-on uh, work experience that's so valuable to help students progress into the labor market. Uh, they're looking at innovation, what we can do to be innovative with our um, ideas to, to allow more expansion of CT programs. And then the, the last part of the rubric looks at um, construction costs. They want it, they want it to be um, a plan that really has a good ratio to the number of students we're bringing in for the cost per square foot of the, of the expansion or construction. And it could be looked at in terms of three things. Are we doing new construction, renovations, and equipment added to the building? And that's, we're looking at a combination of all three. We're bringing in new equipment for our students that's up to date. We're looking at um, knocking down the pool area on our campus that is no longer, hasn't been used since I started here at Sussex Tech since 2013. Um, and reallocate that space with some new construction and then renovation to existing classrooms um, in the career and technical education area that um, needs, needs some updates. So they really want to see an increase in students, but we know there's a limit on how many students we could bring to Sussex Tech. Um, you know, we have, we have between 780 students to 800, um, that, about our average um, for students coming to Tech the last couple of years, and we're really at capacity. So any any additional students, we'd have to be able to manage that growth and make sure we have enough of the academic teachers available to not really push our operating costs up. So our, our plan um, shows for growth in, a, in students because that's, that's part of the grant requirement, but with the understanding that we, we only could grow so much and only offer so many more students the opportunity to come here. So that's why we really focused our grant application on existing programs that could be enhanced to provide better skills and opportunities for students to get new, new equipment and new facilities within the school to enhance what we're already doing here at Sussex Tech. Because our teachers here at our school in the career and technical education area and our academic teachers are outstanding. I really feel that we have one of the best staffs in the state for a vocational high school. The, 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 the type of Learning that goes on at our school is, is very impressive, and our, it's all a credit to our teachers. If it wasn't for them, our students wouldn't have these opportunities. So really, the grant's going to provide our teachers the chance to get some, some updated space in their classroom, equipment, and technology to keep our programs aligned with the industry needs. Every year, we have a partnership day where industry experts come to the building and meet with our teachers and students and talk about what, what's going on in the welding field, what's going on new in the automotive industry that our teachers need to be up on. So by providing them with this opportunity to get this enhancements to our programs, we're going to uh, hopefully see uh, a stronger opportunity for students to learn what's next in uh, their area of study. The way the Doug, grant I have work. a question for you. Um, I'm yeah, sorry, just to, I, before you go on a little further, to, to step back a little bit. So um, with the potential of, you know, possibly expanding enrollment, can you maybe explain for us and then for the public uh, what, what type of maybe state approval that would require? And, um, you know, for how many students w would you anticipate? Um, I know uh, 
as far as your application process, how many students do you typically not accept each year because you are at capacity? So this year, um, I, don't, I don't have the exact date in front of you. I believe we had we had roughly 340 applicants, and we reached out. We, we usually we usually will take about 225 students each year, and right now that freshman class coming in is around around that number. Sometimes students will, um, over the summer, we change our mind and say, I'm not going to attend Tech, I'm going to stay in my local high school. But this year, we really didn't see that. Um, so we have a nice uh, incoming freshman class, so we are at capacity. The students who didn't get in, um, you know, they're, they're sometimes put on wait lists. And if an opportunity for seat opens up, we can always um, reach out to that child before the start of school year. But that really hasn't happened this summer in terms of um, some people declining too many spots that we would open up enrollment. So. To answer your question about the future of the expansion, we're looking between 80 to 120 more students, max. So I would, that's kind of what the proposal looks at now. That could change and maybe uh, based on um, finalizing of the plans once the freeholders have a chance to hear what I have to say and then working um, with you on what you see as the needs of the county, we will, uh, we could always adjust that a little bit based on how the final plan lays out. But usually between 80 to 120 students possibly. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so then we are in a, they grouped the state into three cohorts, Group A, B, and C. So we're, we're competitively um, working with Bergen, Essex, Hudson, Morris, Passaic, and Warren. So those are the, those are, that's our competition. They're going to award two of the smaller grants per group. So there's only going to be two small grants awarded to those schools I mentioned, including us. So we're going up against our, our sister schools. Um, for these opportunities. So we really want to make sure we present a very strong grant application um, and, and, and win one of the grants. They said if there's money left over, because not everybody uses the lot, a lot of 375 million that's, that's allotted for this, that there may be opportunities for some smaller grants to be um, allowed, allotted once, once they know what the financial uh, numbers look like. So uh, that's kind of where we're at with the, the, the process with the rubric and, and going for the grant. Um, so like I said, it's highly, highly competitive, awarded by geographic region, and it's going to score, be scored by the rubric we just discussed. Um, the projects, which is a nice uh, way to look at it, the project is going to be um, supported 75% by the state. What would have to happen is the, uh, the freeholder board would have to support 25% of the grant um, and cover the covered by our, our county. So we understand that the finances and, you know, circumstances, we can't grow too big. We want to, we want to put in for a small grant that's manageable, and we know that those are a number of students won't exceed our capacity and really um, work with the freeholders on what that final plan looks like so we could possibly get that 25% uh, guarantee because we have to have that part of the application process. The freeholders would have to um, – and our board here at school would have to say that they're both in support of this grant before we could submit it. And we would work through those details later once everybody has a chance to hear the presentation and meet at a later date. Um, the key industries that we really focused on, um, which we know that are, are in demand up in Sussex, are manufacturing, uh, technology, healthcare, construction, and energy. Um, in the manufacturing and technology cluster, uh, we're looking to enhance, expand, and improve the mechatronics and robotics and engineering programs study. Um, we really could work closely with the business partners in the county by asking them what, what kind of workers are you looking for coming out of um, high school and post-secondary opportunities that what kind of skills you, are you looking to have and your employees, what machines are they working on? So we were really focused on it, making a better space for them to have, we have a great engineering program right now. We have a really um, up and coming mechatronics program but we, with the enhancements, we really could take it to the next level. Our engineering teacher, Mr. Land, is outstanding, and our space has a lot of good equipment. Um, two years ago, the freeholders did support some new equipment for that program through capital improvements, and it's, it's being well used, and the kids are really learning a lot on it. So the mechatronics area needs, needs a little bit of expansion. So we're looking to build um, a maker space in support of design and collaboration between the two programs and also provide um, cross-curricular meeting space so that the classes can work together. And that, that's a nice element of Sussex Tech. Our teachers really do a good job 
working together on uh, cross-curricular projects through their different expertise. Um, engineering students working with carpentry students um, and building, designing and building projects. The welding students getting involved. So we really have a very nice collaborative effort at the school, and this new space will really enhance that opportunity to take it to the next level. Um, if you go down to the first uh, drawing, this is the area we're looking at is where the, the existing pool is. The green and yellow space would be the additional classroom space added on for mechatronics and engineering. Uh, the one item to the right is a yellow classroom standalone. That would really be at another location on campus off of the existing engineering classroom that has all the equipment um, that they use for CNC operation and different uh, build projects that we have there, the lathes, metal lathes that the teachers use. So that would give him a better, that would give our teacher a better spot to have like really focused um, computer area to work and expand uh, foot footage in his uh, shop. And then a mechatronics teacher would have an opportunity to have that design area, classroom, and the two could work together collaboratively. Um, in the healthcare cluster, um, we're looking to enhance the current allied health program of study that we have on campus, uh, create additional CTE programs of study for sports therapy. That would be, that would be the one new program and create a new allied health uh, laboratory and workspace for both programs. So if you go down to the slide, you'll see um, the, that's the same space we just looked at, but the green and yellow, the yellow indicates where the uh, sports therapy program would be housed and the green area would be where the allied health classroom would be housed. And that would inc inclu incorporate um, a labs area where they have tables for the students to do lab work, uh, classroom space, and then uh, simulated rooms where uh, we could simulate uh, nursing nurses study programs for the students. So um, real nice. Then the, the sports therapy, same thing. It would have classroom space and then an area that would have the, the equipment that a, a physical therapist, sports therapist would use um, when they're working on, on clients and patients. Um, allied health program, it's a state-of-the-art laboratory. Um, and then the, I think the demonstration rooms are really important that the students have that ability to really practice the skills necessary when they go out into the workforce. Um, again, this, this sports therapy program, that space allows for the, the, the high-end equipment to come in that the students would have to work on um, patients and, cl and clients down the road. Um, the project um, proposed projections for the uh, construction and energy. These are more updates to the existing classrooms. So HVAC is a, a really in-demand program in terms of job opportunities for students. We, we want to improve that space so students come in and see and, and, and house it with improved technology that's more modernized in this, in this industry so the students really see the, the potential for earnings after high school if they go right into the, the job market. Because these, these students, um, there's so many um, opportunities that are out there for them just from talking to the trade union. The next one is to expand and enhance the electrical program shop area, which Again, we have a nice space now, but to make it better, we could take over an existing classroom and convert it into a bigger shop area for that teacher um, and, and, and allow them to really bring in new equipment that's up to date in terms of what the industry needs are going to be in the future. And we want to expand our building trades program that really looks at a combination of many um, areas of operation and managing facilities and to include plumbing. Um, and really, the clean energy is a piece we really want to add to that um, HVAC program going forward. Um, does anyone have any questions before I go down to the construction cost on any of the programs or ideas that we have? Anybody? No, I think you can go on. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, so the last page is... Uh, projected costs that we see this would um, entail. We look at construction and renovation, and then we broke it down by furniture and equipment. And the total price on this proposed draft of our grant would be $6,347,356. Um, that, that number is based on what we think we need, 
but again, it, it's a collaborative effort with with the freeholder board to say um, what what can what can the freeholder support, and then we would we would work work our plan around that because we understand the needs of the county. But uh, we really want to take advantage of this one-time opportunity with um, the state supporting 75% of the grant to to, to make sure we could really take Stuspix Tech to another level in terms of what we have here now and just give the opportunity for our teachers who are outstanding um, to have some, uh, some new spaces, some renovation, and some new equipment and still provide those needed skills in the county in the workforce. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, Freeholder Yardley, do you have any questions? I think you may be muted, Freeholder Yardley. I'm sorry. I do not have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Freeholder Fasano? I don't have any questions, Gus. I, I appreciate uh, uh, you coming here with this presentation. This was really informative. Uh, and I appreciate all that you're doing, especially now. I know it's tough to be in um, uh, in education during these times, and uh, I know we were able to talk a little bit about that during that graduation ceremony. So I appreciate all you guys are doing for our students, and I appreciate you giving us an update on this as well. Thank you. Thank you. I, I know it must be extraordinarily difficult in light of what's happening uh, with the schools now, especially you know, having a specialized school that does require uh, equipment and different hands-on procedures. Sometimes it's very difficult to do virtually, so hats off to you and your staff for doing your best. You know, when we did go to the virtual model and, you know, whatever model you're embracing as you move forward, um, you know, I've gotten very positive feedback about the school. And we appreciate everything you're doing. And for this specific uh, presentation, I want to thank you for the comprehensive development of it and for sending it to us for a review prior to the meeting. Um, for looking at the student needs, the county needs, um, again, mentioning more than once that cost is something that you are keeping in mind, which is, you know, which is important. Um, you talked about the job opportunities and, you know, relationships with the community and relationships with the trades. So I really appreciate that, that wide angle lens that you used to kind of, uh, you know, give us a really comprehensive look at the factors you took in, when, in consideration when developing the program. So thank you. All right, thank you. And I'd just like to close. I'd just like to uh, say thank you to the Freeholder Board for all your support. Um, i really like to thank my staff here at Sussex Tech. Um, they're the, they're the, our teachers are the reason why our students are so successful. They work hard, um, and they've been working very hard virtually to provide our kids with um, the best, like you said, the best learning we could possibly have at this time. And we're working hard to ensure that we have a plan ready for um, reopening um, coming up soon. Wonderful. Well, thank you and good luck to you and good luck to your staff. Stay safe. Thank you. Have a great night and thank you. You too. All right. Next on our agenda is public hearings and we have none. And following that is public session from the floor. Now, this is the first of two public sessions. So before I begin with this, I do ask that um, all callers on the line um, do mute their line. Uh, this public session is for questions or comments pertaining to agenda items only. Before we open this session, we ask callers wanting to make a comment to first state your name and municipality. The clerk will create a roster and call each in the order received. Comments are limited to three minutes or less and, again, may only pertain to items on our agenda. At the end of the meeting, there will be a second public session where any um, issue may be brought to the attention of the board. So I'd like to make a motion to open the floor for public comment. I'll make the motion, Herb Yardley. Second. Second, Anthony. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, public session from the floor. If anyone would like to speak, please list your name or state your name, rather, and municipality, so our clerk may create a roster.
Okay, hearing nobody coming forward, I'll make a motion to close the floor for public comment on agenda items. May I have a motion? Herb Yardley, I make the motion. Second? Second, Anthony. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The floor is closed for public comment. Uh, next, we're going to move to freeholders' comments, and we are going to begin with freeholder Fasano. Thank you, freeholder Fantasia, and thanks to all who have joined us this afternoon. First and foremost, I would like to recognize the hard work of all of our staff in response to last week's storm. The county's Office of Emergency Management was activated and played a vital role in coordinating with emergency management officials, municipal leaders, and utility representatives. And I certainly want to thank Deputy Coordinator Hafner and his team for all their efforts. Uh, last week's storm is in the past now. However, the response by some utility providers in some areas of our county were incredibly frustrating for our residents and equally concerning as we're still in the early stages of hurricane season. I look forward to discussing those concerns with our utility representatives. I think many of us were under the impression that there was a lot learned after Hurricane Sandy eight years ago, but still many of our residents had experiences that were reminiscent of that time, and I don't believe that to be acceptable. Today, as you may have heard, our governor spoke a lot about schools reopening safely in September with the Department of Education putting forth guidelines as well. Sussex County understands the importance of opening our schools safely and working directly with our local school districts. The Sussex County Division of Health and the Sussex County Superintendent of Schools have been working with their respective colleagues from Warren and Hunterdon counties to help provide guidance and guidelines to our school districts for a safe return. Our Division of Health is also helping provide pamphlets for schools to distribute to to distribute to students, staff, and parents, along with signage. Sussex County's Public Health Nursing also hosts ongoing calls with school nurses to help them prepare as well. I can't thank our staff enough for all their work in this effort as Sussex County remains committed to helping our schools prepare for a safe, successful opening. For our businesses, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority announced yesterday that it will provide $15.3 million in new CARES Act funding to businesses and counties that receive no direct federal aid. We would be one of those, unfortunately. This funding will go toward fulfilling eligible Phase Two grant applications for businesses in these 12 counties. And Phase Two expanded the Small Business Emergency Assistance Grant Program to a broader range of businesses and increases the maximum grant award to $10,000. For more information, please visit njeda.com or give them a call at 609-858-6767. I am not pleased to say that Sussex County still has not yet received any federal CARES funding. I don't understand it. We are going into our sixth month of this pandemic. Sussex County has already spent about $700,000 on COVID-19 related costs, including testing and PPE. New Jersey was provided with $2.4 billion in federal aid to combat COVID-19, and Sussex County has virtually nothing to show for it. If you find a nickel in your couch cushion right now, you have more money than what the governor has given to Sussex County to combat a global pandemic in one of the hardest hit states in our country. Every day at 1 p.m., I watch the governor talk about how serious this virus is, and I believe him. But every day, he neglects what Sussex County needs seriously to combat it. County government plays a vital role in providing essential services to our residents, protecting the health, safety, and well-being of our residents, and that couldn't be any bit more applicable than a once-in-a-generation pandemic. COVID-19 ultimately sees no county border or political affiliation, and unfortunately, I can't say the same right now about the governor's funding decisions, but nonetheless, the fight for funding continues. And finally, speaking of fighting, Sussex County should be proud of how we continue to fight our fight against this virus, all of us. Our daily numbers show sustained progress, and we shouldn't discount the work it took to an accomplish an important goal, the original goal of flattening the curve. But our success in containing this virus was supposed to translate in the successful safe reopening of our economy, and it's not. A sandwich shop in Sussex County announced that they would be closing permanently on Monday. In their statement, they said, and I quote, this is not how we wanted to leave things. 
Our hope was to be able to give everyone proper time to process, but some things are completely out of our control, end quote. There has to be a better way, or at least a willingness to explore one. As our COVID numbers go down, our economic numbers should rise. It isn't, and I am deeply concerned about how much longer our local economy can sustain an unnecessary and potentially crippling pause. We will continue this fight, our well, uh, this fight as well with our neighbors in Warren and Hunterdon County to advocate for and urge for the reopening of our region's economy safely. Thank you, Freeholder Fantasia, and that concludes my report this evening. Thank you, Freeholder Fasano. Um, Freeholder Yardley? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Freeholder Fasano did a wonderful report and stated things very clearly as we struggle with this governor. And maybe at some point in time, we will get some information as to why he will not provide us with funding, but that's a great report, Anthony. Um, I just wanted to, uh, my report will be short, just comment a little bit on the storm. Um, Sussex County was once again hit with a just a horrible, devastating storm, leaving, of course, thousands of residents without power, uh, of which I was one. And uh, my situation, it lasted for about four days. We were on a generator, and uh, finally uh, it came Came on Friday, and um, I just felt heart wrenched for all of the people that were without power and had damage to their homes. Um, and it just appears that this is becoming a yearly event. Um, and after living here for about 35 years, I, I would like to say, I say that in the past, you know, we would have outages a day, maybe two days. Um, Maybe we'd run some lines from a generator into the house, and um, Sandy came along, and then we had a winter storm. Uh, and I think last year, although we had a mild winter, our, our electric was out for a few days. And eventually, um, myself and, and other people decided we needed to start wiring things up so you could plug it into the house. So we went through this storm. Um, and expected that JCPNL would be well prepared for something like this, and it appeared that did not happen. Um, there's <clears throat> does not appear to be an emergency plan, um, and the mayors of each community did work hard trying to keep all of the residents uh, in their communities informed as best they could. But it was very difficult for people that were in a situation like I was in where you had no power and no internet. So then you're using hotspots trying to get information. Several things happened during that storm to me, as well as other residents, people that live in my community. Uh, we would get messages saying that the, we believe we've corrected your problem. Uh, press one for this and two for that. The problem was the phone Many times the net, it would end up being a message. So you'd have to call them back and tell them, no, the problem was not correct. Because if you don't call them back, they put you down that it, the, there's a correction. There needs to be uh, an additional system developed. Um, so with that going on, um, you know, I was pretty disappointed with the way the repairs took. Um, we had... I think they said at 1.8 thousand people here. Uh, it just seemed that it took a very long time. I would like to, uh, my situation this year was much different um, than it has been in the past. Um, not having any power and internet, uh, having to use the hotspots. Uh, I was on crutches and a wheelchair, which posed a very interesting challenge um, with my wife having to get gas and us having to go out and put gas in the generator. And it did a positive thing for me. Um, you know, since breaking and, and since breaking my foot, um, I became much more aware of the everyday life experiences that individuals with disabilities face. You know, we take for granted our abilities to move independently and manage our daily lives and, you know, while having to use a wheelchair and um, go through everyday activities and barriers and, and, and 
come into play and, and everything from waking up and getting on crutches and maybe and falling, which I did um, uh, with crutches and, and trying to get the dog out um, or going to appointments. You have to rely on other people. And I would like to say that, thank goodness, that we have a great transportation program. Um, I didn't have to use that, but I was thinking that uh, we fund that. We work hard for that. We fought to get additional funding. And um, I said, wow, that's good, because if I were in a wheelchair and didn't have that ability to get somewhere, I know that the county system would be able to do that. Um you know, you throw in a storm, an outage, and uh, it becomes very difficult uh, to to put gas in a generator while you're in a wheelchair. But goodness comes out of all of the neighbors who called to help. Um, the mayor, uh, I want to commend our mayor for calling, see what help we needed and how to get things moving forward. Uh, I, Stillwater has a very good website. Again, a hot spot. You have to use it. So I just wanted to say, as a, an elected official, it's important to maintain that cultural sensitivity, that you see the value of main, things like maintained sidewalks, automatic doors, um, and the, the help that people get, and our friends and neighbors. Um, we've spent in the county a lot of time uh, and effort to improve our AD, ADA parking, um, barrier-free ramps, um, and I think as a restroom, public, a public restrooms, and as we either purchase buildings, improve buildings, we, we make them as ADA compliant. And I just wanted to mention that we um, sometimes uh, don't realize how important those things are. When you And I wanted to say that uh, it gave me an idea or at least uh, an opportunity to say, wow, these things are very important. And I would want to make sure that we continue to implement all the ADA compliances that we have to. Um, and that's just somebody that uh, found himself in a situation that really took it to a step where I said, wow, what pe some people have to live with, we take for granted. So. I just wanted to mention that, um, mention that, and uh, once again, um, to all the people that had damage to their homes and, and from the power outage, um, hopefully there'll be another public utilities hearing, and we'll get an opportunity to testify once again. Uh, maybe we can at least one day get through a storm without having so much um, time that passes before we get the electric on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Freeholder. So, um, Freeholder Deputy, I'm sorry, Freeholder Director Sylvia Patillo is not uh, participating this evening. I do have some information that she normally delivers in her report, and we did speak this afternoon before the meeting, so I'll offer um, our reports uh, somewhat blended. So, first, a huge thank you to Sheriff Strada and uh, our OEM for keeping us surprised throughout the storm. Their communication with us was excellent. Uh, so thank you again. And also I would like to thank Carol Novert. Um, she definitely has a, a rapid response. Um, I'm part of what the freeholders do is constituent services. And when we're contacted by members of the public for an emergency, um, I was able to contact Carol with an immediate response to respond to uh, an elderly individual who needed uh, rapid assistance because of a health condition. Um, and she did not have power, so it was very, very helpful to know that Carol is always very responsive and we're able to get people what they need because, again, we really do offer many health-related services in the county. A lot of people ask, well, what exactly is the role of the county government? And uh, it's just a little piece maybe that some people don't really much think about, and I just want to, again, say thank you. Thank you to Carol and thank you to our administrator, Greg Poff, for uh, always being able to address individual issues, you know, with a, with a real family-like feel for our residents. So uh, also, I'm not going to dwell on the storm. What I can say, it's not our first time at the rodeo, and I don't know when on earth we're going to move. I know there was a, a bill proposed about trimming back uh, some vegetation more aggressively, and it seems to stall. 
Um, this is this is outrageous with the communication. Difficulties too with JCP and LVAT also was not our first time at the rodeo. And uh, I'm, I'm honestly at a loss when we do participate in these hearings as to what an action plan might be because we can sit and talk all we want, but there's going to be another storm. And I would like to know what the action is going to be, not the lip service. So today the governor held his daily press conference, speaking of lip service, at 1 p.m. The New Jersey Supreme Court announced their decision affirming the governor's borrowing of $10 billion on the whim of the governor and um, Senator Sweeney and uh, Coughlin with no voter approval and no legislative review. And I listened to parts of that hearing and I listened to testimony that there are zero restrictions on how these so-called emergency funds could be spent. Uh, they received carte blanche. This money can be spent in any capacity to plug budget holes, I guess, or build a unicorn farm. Why not? It's only our money. Residents are on the hook for $10 billion. Yet the governor still pointed out the need for significant federal funds and his perceived lack of funding from the federal government. Uh, today the governor talked about not receiving a thin dime in addition to federal funds and uh, for Hilda Fasano talked about finding a nickel in the couch, I could do you one better. Our county hasn't received a penny in five months of direct funding. So, Governor, we can relate. We still need the state of New Jersey to step up and provide direct assistance to the county of Sussex. $690,000 spent for COVID-19. So any spin about the federal government individual stimulus checks came to Sussex County, that holds no water. Yes, Sussex Countyans in the entire country received that. I'm very happy to hear that we're included in the counties for the NJEDA business grant funding, <clears throat> but again, does not come directly to the county of Sussex for the $690,000 we've paid for our, from our county budget for COVID testing, personnel, PPE, et cetera. So according to an article published on NewJersey.com, and I'm quoting here from NorthJersey.com, who referred to something on NewJersey.com on July 31st, a report from the U.S. Treasury Department Inspector General encompassing data through July 23rd shows New Jersey has only distributed 51 million or 2.1 percent of its 2.4 billion stimulus monies received in spite of the consistent federal guidance provided to the Murphy administration about allocation of these funds. So neighboring New York and Pennsylvania have already allocated 42 percent and 28 percent respectively according to this Treasury report. So what I did today is I took the words of the governor, what he just spoke just a few short hours ago. He spoke at 1 o'clock. And I figured if I spoke in his own language, he may understand me. So he said all of these things in relation to the federal government. So I took the liberty of borrowing his words and changing his view from state to federal to my view from county to state. So I went something like this. This cannot continue to twist in the political winds. This isn't about red or blue. We cannot rely on half measures that have no clear guidance pushing more costs on the county, money, I might add, that we don't have. We need you to act and finally get something done, and we need you to do it now. You know that phrase, go big or go home? With all due respect, Governor Murphy, history will be unsparing if we come up small, as you have so far, for the county of Sussex. So that leads to my next point. We can't legislate in unequitable ways that create a class of winners and losers. The myopic vision on display by executive orders leave no room for consideration of facts and further alienating our business owners. The executive orders have failed and continue to fail business owners in Sussex County and business owners across the state of New Jersey. Uh, case in point, yesterday I virtually attended the Belmar hearing uh, that resulted in a vote of five to one to strip the business license of Attila's Gym in Belmar. I also had the opportunity to speak during the public session, and this vote was absolutely shameful. I challenged the absolute lack of science behind Governor Murphy's arbitrary opening decisions and zero basis for capricious executive orders. Currently, we have summer camps, uh, open full contact sports, martial arts schools, casinos, mass transit, daycares, beauty salons, dance studios, they're all open, and public schools may open if they meet safety guidelines. There'll be more on that in a minute. So, Governor Murphy, we're waiting for you to show us the science and show us the catastrophic results of open gyms right across our border in Pennsylvania. We need to stop picking winners and losers, stroking Trenton egos. This is just plain wrong. I discussed this in our, our last meeting. We need to support SCR 117, proposing a state constitutional amendment that would rein in gubernatorial powers. 
This would limit executive orders to 14 days and extensions beyond must receive approval from the state legislature. So moving on to Governor Murphy's uh, statement on schools today, a couple things. The New Jersey Department of Health is going to release additional health guidance for schools, including a regional risk matrix. And this matrix is going to determine if or when schools need to shut down in a community or a region. Now, Sussex was placed in the Northwest region, and we were placed with Warren County, Morris County, and oddly enough, Passaic County, and not Hunterdon County. Passaic was one of the counties. And, and that kind of made me take pause. So I looked up a little bit of information about this. Now, Sussex County has a total of uh, about 1,300. I think the last number I have here is 1,341 confirmed uh, cases of COVID. We have about 144,000 residents. Now, Passaic County has just over 500,000 residents. And they've had 17,748 cases, so that's an infection rate of 3.5%. I know there's some variables there for availability of testing, but my concern is if we are looked at, uh, our schools are looked at, and we encompass uh, Passaic County in with us that determines whether our schools stay open or closed, I feel like that's a real apples and orange situation. So just keep that in mind when, uh, when there's regional closings or, you know, determinations for schools. Uh, also, the Department of Health is going to provide specific instructions on steps to take if a child or staff member contracts COVID-19. So um, schools will receive that information. And then from the Department of Education, every school district must certify that they meet health and safety standards. Um, districts may implement 100% remote learning if they can't meet the current safety guidelines, but they must submit a plan and a target date for reopening. And oddly enough, such districts are encouraged to open space for students to participate in virtual learning at their school buildings or with community partners for students who need digital connectivity or spaces to learn. So if the schools are closed and going all virtual, the suggestion is to open up a part of your school regardless for students who may need a space still to learn, which to me means going to school. So I'm not quite sure what that would look like, but that was, that was uh, part of the guidance. So to share with you some information uh, from our health department, our COVID-19 stats as of August 10th, total number of residents that have been tested, 23,294. Total residents positive, okay, so as of the 10th, 1341 is not the latest number, it's 1378 with a 6% positivity rate. Total residents recovered, 1,173. That's an 85% recovery rate, and total deaths, 198. That is a 14.4% fatality rate. Now, in our nursing home, total residents tested positive, or 444, which is 32% of the positive rate in the county, is from nursing homes. And sadly enough, 114 of those deaths represent 58% of the fatalities in nursing homes, which may help explain that, um, that sobering 14.4% fatality rate. Um, so residents are aware CVS in Byram and in Sparta are both offering COVID testing. Now our new COVID case numbers have been low since early June and the trend continued through July and the first half of August. Um, the numbers of new COVID cases remain in the single digits in Sussex County while testing has significantly increased. So if you're following the reports that we release on Fridays, you know that we release again then on Monday. So you'll see a three-day total. So I know sometimes it's alarming if you say, whoa, look at that number. That's much higher than the day prior, and it's simply because uh, it's a compilation of three days. Um, the Office of Mosquito Control gave us a post-tropical storm Isaiah update in rainfall for August. Rainfall for August is measured between three and five inches throughout the county. Sussex County Mosquito Control completed a second air spray application on Thursday, August 6th. A total of 1,967 acres were treated. The office is expected to see an uptick of mosquito populations in some areas due to the amount of rainfall received from the tropical storm. Now, as far as the disease surveillance update, we have mosquito samples being tested regularly for West Nile virus, Eastern Equine Encephalitis, Jamestown Canyon Virus, St. Louis Encephalitis, and La Crosse Virus. All mosquito samples that are submitted to the Office of Mosquito Control for mosquito-borne disease testing as of June 1st to date have all been tested as negative. 
Rutgers University Center for Vector Biology reported 23 West Nile virus positive samples, one Eastern Equine Encephalitis positive sample, and four Jamestown Canyon positive samples across the entire state of New Jersey for 2020. But again, none of those came from Sussex County. Um, now I want to touch on something that we haven't been uh, paying much attention to, but it's right around the corner for us, and that is flu season. So influenza is so common that the number of people infected each season can't even be defined, but is estimated by the CDC. And the CDC calculates the annual percentage of the U.S. population infected with the flu at about 8%, which should be 26.4 million people a year. But the CDC has since stated that from October 1st, 2019 to April 4th, 2020, so in about six months, there have been 39 million to 56 million flu illnesses and anywhere from 419,000 to 740,000 hospitalizations for the flu with anywhere from 24,000 to 62,000 deaths. So here's kind of where it goes off the rails. Infection rates are highest among children. The CDC reports that between 20 and 30 percent of children, United States children, get the flu every year. So if you do the math, the United States has roughly 74 million kids living in the U.S., so the estimation is anywhere from 15 million to 22 million children will typically catch the flu, even with a widely available, affordable yearly vaccine. And each year, the United States uh, has about 155 million doses of flu vaccine in the arsenal. And if you get the flu vaccine, it cuts your chances of getting infected in half, and it's going to protect you from roughly three or four flu strains. Now, I myself, I always vaccinated my kids against the flu, but I've never really witnessed, um, you know, a rush, a throngs of, you know, families and parents storming the castle for flu shots. But as a point of reference, flu killed 179 children in 2018-2019. So, uh, you know, for comparison, we all know that COVID-19 is not the flu. But uh, just to kind of compare the two, 74 million children in the United States and the current under-18 COVID-19 infection rate is about 1.3% of children have been infected with COVID-19 as opposed to 20 or 30% with the flu. Child mortality, there was 43 states in New York City that had reported um, that children comprise 0% to maybe 0.8% of all COVID-19 deaths. And 20 of those states reported zero child deaths from COVID-19. And in the states reporting uh, anywhere from 0% to 0.3% of all child COVID-19 cases resulted in death. Now, it's difficult to get definitive numbers of actual child deaths from the coronavirus, but um, I'm hoping that parents are looking at the upcoming flu season with equal fervor that we're looking at COVID. College update. Sussex County residents who are interested in serving on the Sussex County Community College Board of Trustees are invited to submit statements of interest and resumes for consideration. And I want to note that uh, the preferred candidate will have career technical experience, in other words, in the trades or manufacturing. Uh, as the college is expanding those programs, we are looking for someone with expertise that they can bring to the board. So resumes and applicant statements should be sent by mail no later than Friday, August 21st, or via email. You can either mail them to the Sussex County Administrator at 1 Spring Street, Newton, 07860, or you can email um, your statement and your resume to lpalmer, L-P-A-L-M-E-R, at sussex.nj.us. And my last update is for the Sussex County Library System. A couple updates, they're doing a Library Lines podcast and where they have branch librarians highlight titles that are coming out um, in the next season and they talk about some of the library's virtual book club offerings. Also, they started a new service that's called Matchbook and what they do is they actually survey you and you answer some simple questions and they will find you a personalized selection, a book they think is a good match for you in about a week's time, so that's a nice service. And appointments for Grab and Go continue, <clears throat> so you can schedule your library visit and Grab and Go um, if you go to picktime.com backslash SCLS, or you can just call your local library. So just keep that in mind that the library is still active and, um, again, opening in, in smaller phases to be able to best serve the public. 
So that concludes my comments uh, for this evening, and we're going to move on to the next portion of our agenda, which is the approval of the consent agenda. Now, the Board of Chosen Freeholders of the County of Sussex has reviewed the consent agenda consisting of various proposed resolutions and determined that adoption of the said resolutions is in and will further the public interest. If any freeholder would like to remove an item to be considered separately, please do so now. So may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda resolutions A through J? So moved, Anthony. Second. Herbal second, I'm sorry. Thank you. Roll call vote. Uh, Deputy Director Fantasia. Yes. Freeholder Fasano. Yes. Freeholder Yardley. Yes. Next approval of minutes, regular meeting and executive session minutes from July 22nd, 2020. Can I have a motion to approve the regular and executive session minutes? Herb Yardley, I make the motion. Second. And second, Anthony. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, number 12, appointments and or resignations. We have none. Then moving on to 13 is our resolutions, uh, motion to adopt uh, said resolutions A through M. I'll make the motion, Herb Yardley, to approve resolutions um, thir number 13A to M. Second. Second, Anthony. Discussion? Okay, hearing uh, no discussion, I myself would like to please uh, share and read into the record letter J, which is a resolution opposing the exclusive use of mail-in ballots for the general election in November of 2020. And the resolution reads, Whereas the state of New Jersey has a secretary of state and county clerks in each of the 21 counties whose duties include the administration and overseeing of elections. And whereas the state of New Jersey will be holding a general election in November 2020. And whereas mail-in ballots were used exclusively in the primary election in July 2020. And whereas the universal distribution of mail-in ballots to all registered voters caused concerns for voter fraud and mail-in elections and significant delays in counting ballots. And whereas the universal distribution of mail-in ballots to all registered voters is also of significant cost and is an unfunded mandate. And whereas well before the COVID-19 pandemic, New Jersey law permitted voting by mail for any reason or no reason at all, allowing any voter the option to request a mail-in ballot, thus enhancing voter choice. And whereas some voters have expressed an opinion of wishing to wait until election day to cast their ballot electronically for the candidate of their choice to fully assess the latest information available. And whereas the Board of Chosen Freeholders of Sussex County are gravely concerned that the exclusive mail-in ballot experiment has been difficult at best and during the primary election cycle representing a small fraction of the ballots to be cast when compared to the upcoming general election. And whereas the Board of Chosen Freeholders of Sussex County feels strongly that voter choice should refer to how to vote, not just who to vote for, in a given election cycle. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Sussex County Board of Chosen Freeholders oppose the exclusive use of mail-in balloting in the general election in November 2020 and in all future elections. And be it further resolved that the Sussex County Board of Chosen Freeholders urges the Secretary of State and the County Clerks to utilize in-person voting in conjunction with mail-in balloting in the general election of November 2020 and in all future elections. 
and be it further resolved that the clerk of the board forward a certified true copy of this resolution to the New Jersey Secretary of State, the Governor of the State of New Jersey, President of the New Jersey State Senate, the Speaker of the General Assembly, the New Jersey Association of Counties, and all other boards of chosen freeholders. Certified as a true copy, adopted by the freeholders on this day, uh, August 12, 2020. Okay, so that concludes our discussion. Any discussion after me reading that into the record, gentlemen? Okay, then we'll take a roll call vote. Deputy Director Fantasia? Yes. Freeholder Fasano? Yes. Freeholder Yardley? Yes. Okay, next we have awards of contract and change orders bids. And the Board of Chosen Freeholders of the County of Sussex has reviewed the award of contract change orders bids consisting of various proposed resolutions and determined that adoption of the said resolutions is in and will further the public interest. So I need a motion to approve resolutions A through G. Hi, this is Herb. I will, Herb Yardley, I will make the motion to adopt resolutions from A to G. Thank you. Second. Second, Anthony. Discussion? Roll call vote. Deputy Director Fantasia? Yes. Freeholder Fasano? Yes. Freeholder Yardley? Yes. Okay. Uh, next, our financial, um, we have A, resolution, payment of the bills list for August 12th, 2020. I need a motion to approve the bills list. Herb Yardley, I'll make the motion to approve the bill list. Second. Second, Anthony. Discussion? Roll call vote. Deputy Director Fantasia. Yes. Freeholder Fasano? Yes. Freeholder Yardley? Yes. Next, uh, on to the personnel report, which there is no new personnel report this evening, and then to Administrator Pa for his administrative report. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Director. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to report uh, and was previously touched upon uh, by Deputy Director Fantasia that uh, the Sheriff's Office of Emergency Management uh, did, a, did a very good job uh, through the tropical storm in terms of supporting uh, our municipal emergency management partners, uh, in addition to coordinating with the County Division of Roads and uh, JCPNL. I would also like to uh, thank the sheriff and Bob Hafner particularly uh, for their efforts in coordinating that and also, too, to recognize the County Division of Roads uh, that uh, worked diligently to clear uh, a number of county road closures, uh, and they did so uh, with a, a great degree of skill and professionalism, and uh, they should be recognized for their efforts. Uh, certainly having a uh, tropical storm come through the county uh, have the type of impact that it did uh, all while dealing with the pandemic uh, certainly has uh, demonstrated the very real challenges that we as a county are facing. Um, but I'm very pleased to say that the staff met the challenge and continued to do as best as we could under the circumstances. Uh, and that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you. Uh, next, our county council report. Uh, nothing for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, unfinished business. Does any freeholder have unfinished business to discuss? Hearing none, any new business to introduce? Hearing none, we'll move to our second public session from the floor. This public session is for general questions. Now, before we open this session, we ask callers wanting to make a comment to first state your name and your municipality, and the clerk will create a roster and call each of you in the order received. 
Comments are limited to three minutes or less. So may I have a motion to open the floor for public comment? Herb Yardley, I'll make the motion. Second. Second, Anthony. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, at this moment, I would like to open the floor and again first, we are going to have you state your name and your municipality and the clerk will create a roster. Uh, Chris Carney, Frankfort Township. Thank you. Any other member of the public, would you like your name to be added to the roster to speak this evening? Okay, Terry. Yes, Mr. Carney, you have three minutes or less. Thank you. I'll be quick. Thank you. I just have two quick comments. Um, it's, it's just a shame that uh, you have to be a Democrat in the state of New Jersey to get any help. Um, the most hypocritical, per hypocritical person that I've actually ever met is the governor, and it's a shame. But I appreciate what you guys are doing, what your resolution and whatnot, and try to get some money here. Um, on another note, I couldn't agree with you more with your other resolution with the mail-in ballots. I was totally against it with the primary. Uh, I had a run in the primary. I was lucky enough to run unopposed. But, uh, you know, I can go to Walmart any time of the day, but I can't go in and, 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 and vote in, in person. It's it's a shame. That's real a shame. But uh, you guys are doing a good job, and I appreciate it. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we appreciate your, you know, your words for that. And we see the, the pressure that it's putting on the individual municipalities as well. And, uh, you know, we're all definitely doing our best to try to elicit some kind of change with this. This is absolutely unconscionable. Before I close, I just want to see if there were any latecomers. Does anybody else wish to speak or comment back to Mr. Carney? Okay, thank you, Mayor. So, um, hearing no one else come forward, I'd like to make a motion to close the um, session to the public. Herb Yardley, make the motion. Second. Second, Anthony. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So next on to reminders, uh, please check the county's website at www.sussex.nj.us for upcoming meeting schedules. Next on our agenda is executive session. It is a closed session, so I'm going to uh, turn this to Terry to please read the statement. Thank you. Whereas the subject matters about to be discussed may be excluded from the public portion of the meeting by resolution of the Board of Chosen Freeholders as an exception to the Open Public Meetings Act for students to NJSA 10 colon 4 dash 12 B, and whereas it appears necessary for the Board of Chosen Freeholders to discuss such matters in executive session, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Chosen Freeholders of the County of Sussex, in accordance with the provisions of NJSA 10 colon 4 dash 12 B, and NJSA 10 colon 4 dash 13, the board at this time enter into executive session from which the public shall be excluded, and be it further resolved that the general nature of the subject to be discussed relate to the following items authorized by NJSA 10 colon 14 dash 12B as designated. Number six, matters relating to public safety and property, topic new and green. Number seven, matters relating to litigation and negotiations in the attorney-client privilege topic, Sussex County Bridge Q6, Town of Newton, Township of Sparta. And number eight, matters relating to the employment relationship topic, personnel guidance slash policies. Be it further resolved that the deliberations conducted in closed sessions may be disclosed to the public upon the determination of the Sussex County Board of Chosen Freeholders or provided 
sorry. I love that the public interest will no longer be served by such confidentiality, and be it further resolved that upon completion of the business which the board has entered into the executive session, this is where I need clarification. Will you be resuming back and open, or will you be adjourning from executive session? Uh, Kevin, will we be taking action? Because if we are not, I believe that we can adjourn from executive. Uh, we're not, and we can. Oh. Okay, okay, thank you. So the, the board uh, shall not reconvene and resume its meeting open to the public, and it will not take formal action, um, and therefore will adjourn from executive session. Okay, thank you, Terry. So I need a motion to adopt the executive session resolution and enter into executive session. All in favor? I'll make Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> okay, so uh, we are going to move into executive session. I'd like to take a moment again uh, to thank the residents of Sussex County who participated in this call. Uh, we appreciate your time and your interest, and again, a reminder that we are in constituent services, and if there's anything that you ever need in any type of emergency situation like we did just experience, uh, you know, we're always ready, and we're here, and we're poised to help you, and we will always do our best uh, to assist you. So thank you, and please stay safe, and uh, have a wonderful week. Thank you.